Welcome to our webcast, Design and Deployment Best Practices for a Reliable Fiber Optic Network, sponsored by Panduit. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering. To get the best results from the Control Engineering webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you're having technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you're experiencing issues with your slide or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume settings of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get back to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions area on the left side of your screen. You can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen to type questions for the speaker during the presentation for the Q&A session at the end. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that are for today's presenter will be answered verbally during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. To download presentation slides, or if you'd like to download a certificate of completion from today's event, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of your screen. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineer website in a few days, and we'll send you an email message with a link connecting directly to it after it's ready. Today's webcast sponsor is Panduit. Thank you for supporting this program. Now I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speaker. Bob Elliott is the Business Development Manager with responsibility for copper and fiber cable and connectivity with the Industrial Automation Infrastructure Group at Panduit Corporation, a global leader in network and electrical infrastructure solutions based in Tinley Park, Illinois. In his position, Bob is responsible for the development of business case to approve projects and programs that lead to new business generation and new product introductions. Bob has responsibility for understanding solutions to customer problems and requirements, defining programs and new product performance, putting forward to management recommendations to expend resources to design, develop, and release new products that are in alignment with the Industrial Automation Infrastructure Group's goals and objectives. Bob's been with Panduit for 10 years with experience in engineering design, research, development, and product line management. He is a graduate of Queen Mary College, University of London, with a Bachelor of Science in Physics with Electronics and a PhD in Reflector Electromagnetics. I'm Mark T. Hosky, webcast moderator and content manager for Control Engineering since 1994. Before we continue, please take a moment to remind yourself about dealing with technical issues during this presentation. And now on to Bob's presentation. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for the opportunity to talk today about the design and deployment best practices for a reliable fiber optic network. Just a very brief uh, overview of the agenda. I set the stage with an introduction, talk about applicable fiber cabling standards, we then talk about reference architectures and zone architecture in particular. Then we head towards selecting the correct fiber. We describe some applications and finally round off the presentation by describing some best practices. As we've seen, fiber is becoming a more and more relevant part of industrial applications. There are strong needs to provide performance in the network at the same time familiarity is growing and the skills need is being addressed, making the deployment and installation of fiber easier. In today's presentation, we're going to build your familiarity with fiber, including its application in the industrial space, the standards and architectures that provide application guidance and use cases. We'll also talk about the selection of fiber based on its place in the network topology and round us off 
with best practices, identifying different fiber types for use in different areas of the industrial application. So we want to start by talking a bit more about fiber and its use in industrial applications. Many network and controls engineers are weighing the use of fiber in more parts of the network versus something they and the installers may be more familiar with, for example, twisted copper cabling, twisted pair copper cabling, I'm sorry. So some of the areas, in fact, where fiber would be used in the industrial space versus that of copper, obviously the big one here is the ability to span longer distances than a uh, twisted pair copper cabling channel. Currently, twisted pair with uh, supporting Ethernet is limited to distances of 100 meters. And of course, in the office or in local areas, uh, this is fine. But some of these industrial applications involve huge plants uh, occupying many hundreds, uh, hundreds of square, uh, thousands of square feet. So the ability to, to uh, span longer distances uh, is very much required by fiber. Fiber also gives uh, advantages in terms of the overall bandwidth that can be covered. That translates directly to the data rate. Uh, it also helps with situations where um, convergence uh, is required. That's the recovery speed, for example, uh, with a, if a, a switch should fail. And of course, fiber gives uh, security. It's both security from radiated uh, signals that might arise from a cable, but also its susceptibility to electromagnetic interference, that is, outside interference. There are, uh, in addition, uh, industrialized uh, armored fiber types. These are very common that uh, provide uh, extreme durability and protection against uh, mechanical uh, sort of knocks and scrapes. And finally, the reliability and speed of installation is, is always uh, improving and uh, reducing the total cost of ownership. So I like to look at this slide as the really the, the, the pivotal slide that underlies the whole of really what we're going to talk about here. That is the converged plant-wide Ethernet uh, architecture that's been outlined by leaders such as Cisco Systems and Rockwell automation really sort of shows the key elements of a successful design uh, of an Ethernet IP uh, network design. And really, when you look through this logical diagram, uh, it really points to the fact we need to understand the application, the, uh, then develop this logical framework. The, the diagram on the right is really a topology that sort of shows the uh, network schematic uh, and where the uh, uh, largest uh, items of uh, equipment are in terms of switching, firewall, and then as the enterprise network transitions to the industrial automation network, you can see the existence of uh, cells or manufacturing zones in uh, at the bottom of that diagram, level zero to two, and that's showing three different architectures that are supported by this topology. This is the familiar, familiar star topology on the left, the ring topology in the center, and a bus ring topology on the right-hand side. So translating this a little bit more to the actual shop floor environment itself, what we see here is a typical a uh, factory floor layout uh, indicating where some of these key physical layer elements uh, will be located. Uh, the idea um, at the bottom right hand side, uh, we see uh, a uh, so called micro data center. This is effectively is a, um, uh, an equipment room for uh, shop floor computing uh, equipment. Fiverr would come from this, for example, to uh, along those uh, pathways to a zone enclosure, and from the zone enclosure, which might itself include uh, switching equipment, would, for example, come copper links that would be uh, connected to each 
of a number of control panels. So having sort of set the stage, uh, we now want to kind of take a, 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 a slight change here to talk about some of the standards that are relevant and, and pertinent to the design of a reliable physical layer network. One of the key documents uh, that I think uh, here is the uh, TIA, that's the Telecommunications Industries Association Standard for Industrial Premises. It was devised by the um, TR42.9 Industrial Infrastructure Subcommittee and was first published, or was, was uh, most recently updated and published in May of 2012. An addendum has just been added very recently to that standard, uh, outlining and defining the so called M12 X coded connector that has eight pins and is able to support at higher data rates. And we'll talk about that a little later. So this standard kind of defines um, the industrial uh, environment in terms of uh, different uh, areas, the industrial areas themselves, the telecommunications spaces, that is something like the telecommunications room, the pathways, talks about fire stopping, but also backbone and horizontal cabling, and grounding and bonding uh, best practices. TIA 1005 fits within a larger framework of telecommunication standards that have been developed and released by the TIA. And what I have in this diagram is, is on the left-hand side, we, we define the common standards. These are uh, really the, the baseline documents for describing some of these areas and attaching applicable standards and performance requirements to them. TIA 568C.0 uh, then forms the basis for uh, premise standards, uh, that is, a particular type of application uh, takes 568C.0 and then uh, adds on to it its particular requirements. For example, uh, a data center or a healthcare facility, uh, or as we see here, uh, the industrial uh, premises. Then finally, uh, you can see on the right-hand side of this diagram, uh, the component standards, uh, C.2, which is applicable for copper cabling, and C.3, of course, which is uh, applicable for optical fiber. I want to just uh, talk now a little bit about zone architecture. Um, this is the idea of, um, you can see here on the left-hand side, what I'm trying to depict here is uh, where cabling is routed from a telecom room or a network room to each device. It could be a control panel, for example, that uh, is then associated with the machine. The problem with this is that it's difficult to um, a, carry out moves, adds, and changes on these, uh, this home run kind of design. So that a, a better practice uh, is shown on the right-hand side, which is to use pathways uh, carrying uh, common uh, data cables, perhaps then to a zone enclosure, marked in this figure with Z, Z and then a shorter cabling runs from the zone enclosure to those different machines. It reduces installation time, for example. Uh, it's easier, actually, to future-proof uh, that design as well. What is future-proofing? Future-proofing is the idea that you don't um, design your cabling, your physical layer, to accommodate um, today's network needs. You actually look at, for tomorrow's needs. Um, for example, we've seen cases where um, copper cabling, for example, and, and fiber also can be expected to last for 10, 15, or 20 years. The kind of data that uh, it, it would be run in future years uh, could exceed the performance requirements of that cable. So this does allow you to uh, take into account future proofing in an easier manner. For example, uh, 
installing a high performance fiber between that network room and the zone enclosure, and then uh, copper cabling that can be uh, upgraded at a later time. This just shows uh, an example of that zone architecture on a shop floor, and you can see uh, towards the left hand side there the, the um, letters MDC. Uh, it, it's a, a term we use for the micro data center, which is a telecom room, for example, uh, on the uh, shop floor. And then the use of pathways, common pathways to zone enclosures, which can then feed uh, a variety of uh, control panels. This is an example of how this hierarchy can be um, you know, looked at here in this diagram. If you look towards the the, the top part of this diagram, you can see uh, home run kind of configurations leading from the telecom room to each of those uh, uh, nodes or control panels. This example shows how a fiber to the enclosure design could be used to um, you know, fiber feed uh, an enclosure and then have copper cabling links to each of some uh, closely spaced control panels. This design is also a, a available and applicable to um, topologies and configurations using uh, resilient Ethernet protocol, which incorporates a ring design where you can see now that fiber cabling is used to uh, connect each of these zone enclosures in a ring-like fashion. And the reason for doing uh, that, of course, is because that gives you higher reliability. If, for example, it's a, a particular uh, switch is um, uh, fails at any point, then communication can still take place uh, going through the reverse way around that ring. This is an example for, uh, of a, um, a zone enclosure uh, that's, that's used for industrial applications. In a typical plant floor, these would be located, for example, on a pillar uh, or you know, in, in some kind of a, a support arrangement that's, that's actually on the floor, uh, specially uh, uh, installed for it. What you see here is on the top left-hand side of this uh, image, you can see um, dielectric armored fiber distribution cable uh, entering the enclosure. It then is taken through to the um, device that you can see on the right, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, on the control panel wall, a slack spool, and then uh, it, it's, it's terminated and patch cords used to attach that to a um, DIN rail mounted uh, distribution uh, 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 enclosure. The fiber is then fed itself to the uh, through uh, fiber patch cords is fed to the switch, and you can see the white cables are copper cables that are then taken out to a patch, a DINRAIL patch solution on the right-hand side, and then horizontal cables, uh, copper, are taken out uh, f from that. So when do we want to, to think about using fiber? Some of the areas where we would want to use it is the switch-to-switch -switch links in resilient uh, Ethernet protocol. We've already mentioned this. And that allows us to get very uh, high availability. Uplinks, of course, that go along those pathways that require higher bandwidth capabilities, and of course, especially extended lengths. Applications requiring low convergence time. We talked about the uh, switch uh, in the event of a failure. Uh, the ring will need to uh, you allow the communication to go in the other direction and, and effectively pick up where it left off. It takes a little time to do that, uh, but with optical fiber, that tends to be that just slightly bit uh, better than, uh, than uh, copper cabling. Security uh, in, in installations and applications, uh, environments that are subject to high EMI and noise, and of course, it satisfies level two requirements with no spark generation. This is a, a, quite a complex diagram, but what it shows um, is how fiber can be deployed at uh, all the levels of an industrial network. 
You may recall the slide quite early on in the presentation that talked about the, uh, what the typical shop floor looks like. We can see here the, on the left-hand side uh, the um, micro data center is then uh, fed by cable uh, from a, a DMZ or a, a, an enterprise. Cable, cabling, uh, armored cabling then goes to that uh, uh, zone enclosure. Uh, we can use uh, dielectric conduited fiber uh, in those areas where uh, we don't have um, a pr protection, adequate protection provided for the uh, optical fiber. And finally, right at the end, at the node, for example, uh, field install optical fiber, our so-called polymer clad fiber or PCF fiber, can be used uh, in situations and really uh, is helped out by the installation. It's not as difficult uh, to install as, for example, a multi-mode or single-mode cable. So it's electrician friendly and, and provides very good uh, installation of reliability. So selecting the right fiber requires several things. First of all, obviously, know, you need to know the equipment and the kind of network that you're connecting to. You need to understand the distance, what type of fiber can be used for that distance. You need to know the requirements for bandwidth, the fiber count, and then finally, the type of fiber. And also, and peculiar or particular to the industrial environment, you need to know the kind of environment into which that uh, fiber is going to be installed. Is it subject to uh, mechanical forces and uh, shock or vibration? Uh, what about ingress requirements of uh, water and dust and other particles? So as you look at the first of those bullets, we talk about knowing the, uh, the equipment that you're uh, discussing. Here I'm actually showing a um, Rockwell Automation uh, Stratix type switch. And on the left-hand side at the bottom left, you'll see four ports. Two of those ports are for uh, fiber uplinks. Um, and how that, that is done is uh, using what we call an SFP module, a small form factor pluggable module that attaches into that switch, into those uh, uh, fiber optic ports, and, and fiber is attached to the uh, rear of the uh, SFP module that goes uh, into that. Let's just look at that in a, a, a bit more detail. The SFP uh, modules will go into those two ports. There are two ports there. Um, it really depends how you use it, but if you use it in a hierarchical star arrangement, one of those ports would be a main port, and then the other would be a redundant port. If you used the switch in resilient Ethernet protocol, for example, then effectively um, one of those ports would be used for the uh, going around the ring clockwise. The other one would be for going around the ring anti-clockwise, for example. That's an example of what the SFP module uh, looks like. And then you can see here on the, the rear end of the uh, modular transceiver, this shows uh, the, the very commonplace now uh, so-called LC connector interface. On the right-hand side, you can see this uh, dual um, connector type here, uh, LC. The uh, two ports are spaced about six millimeters uh, apart. And uh, there are many other uh, fiber connectors available, but these um, are most commonly used uh, in, in this kind of environment. The SFP module is also, um, you know, de it depends on the data rate that's used for uh, the network, and that has an impact on the type of uh, SFP transceiver that you require here. In addition, uh, and we'll talk about this uh, in a moment, uh, you need a different type of SFP module depending on whether you're going to be using multi-mode fiber or single-mode fiber. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So now that we understand the equipment, we've got to take a look 
at some of the um, other criterion. We've talked about uh, the type of cable and the bandwidth, the fibre count, uh, the jacket rating, the application, kind of environment, the types of connectors being used, and then finally, the loss budgets. The loss budgets permitted in the different uh, optical fibres comes actually out of the TIA uh, 568 document that we talked before, and they're just uh, replicated here. So, um, OM1, this is a multi-mode uh, fiber uh, type 1, um, and then multi-mode you know, will have a, a, a maximum channel attenuation of 2.6 dB. OM2 has a channel attenuation uh, of 3.6 dB, and, and you can see the rest of the values on the uh, table. That channel attenuation directly influences the uh, overall length that uh, that optical fiber can support uh, transmission. And you can see the types of distances uh, replicated in this table. The fiber optic uh, budget um, really is a um, way of describing the uh, signal uh, that is lost on transmission through the whole of that optical channel. There is a, a number of reasons why uh, the uh, attenuation occurs, occurs. There is a uh, insertion loss or attenuation that takes place at each connection uh, in an optical fiber channel. And in addition, uh, there is a loss of signal per unit length along that fiber. On the top right, you can see some representative values here. Of, uh, uh, it depends on the wavelength at which the uh, optical transmission takes place. Uh, for example, 3.5 decibels per kilometer at uh, 850 nanometer wavelength. The term dB per kilometer is a measure of how much signal is lost over a length of a kilometer of the fiber. The dB is a logarithmic scale that basically, uh, it, you know, each time the power is halved, uh, it, it reduces by 3 dB. So if you get to a point where you've lost half of the power, you have a 3 dB insertion loss. If you get to a further point where you've actually lost three quarters of the power, so that you've only got one quarter left, then you then you have um, a, a loss of 6 dB. And so you can see in the lower diagram here uh, the combination of the loss per kilometer or loss per distance and the loss associated with each connector or could be splice as well. And ob obviously the objective is to have a positive margin, that is the received power is greater than the received sensitivity. This is a bit of a complex diagram, uh, but I, I, I just put it in there for reference because it sort of shows um, the different attenuations of fiber, and, and, and basically, you know, with a, with a uh, an assumed connector loss for the OM2 type of fiber, uh, you can support. I'm sorry, for the OM1 type of fiber, you can support a 275 meter channel length. With the OM2 fiber, this is supporting 1,000 base SX, which is a gigabit signaling. Uh, you can support a longer distance, 550 meters. So let's just talk about fiber itself. What, what sort of makes up the fiber? As I talked before, there are two basic types, um, single mode and multi-mode that we'll sort of describe in this uh, presentation. Single mode is used for longer distances, um, but it is, uses um, more expensive uh, transceiver technologies. Multi-mode uh, is suitable for shorter distances, and it's more cost-effective uh, for uh, use in typical industrial uh, environments. At the heart of the optical fiber, of course, is the core and the cladding. The, both of these are uh, generally made out of silica, and the cladding uh, is just a slightly lower refractive index than the core. And there's a buffer coating that provides protection to the uh, core and cladding. That's surrounded by a strengthening material. 
Aramid, which some of us may know as uh, Kevlar. And then finally, a durable, typically PVC or polyethylene jacket uh, surrounds uh, all of that. Single mode fiber, just the core and cladding. This shows you the kind of uh, dimensions that the optical fiber is, 125 microns across, and the core is only 9 microns. The two types, types of multi-mode fiber, uh, on the left-hand side, the, the OM1 fiber incorporates a 62.5 micrometer core, whereas OM2 through 4 occupy a 50 uh, micrometer or micron core. There's also another type of fiber that we've mentioned, polymer-coated fiber, where, in fact, the uh, outside dimension of that uh, is, is significantly larger and will allow you uh, a, a much uh, easier time of installation. So uh, it's very useful to use in those kind of areas that require uh, field installation right down you know, in the area of the control panel and the machine. And this complex diagram just shows all of these three together. So we've mentioned uh, the term OM, uh, optical fiber multimode. Uh, OM1, really, uh, this this fiber has been used on legacy systems. Uh, there's a lot of it about in the field. Uh, typically, in a new installation, uh, we'd recommend uh, OM2 or OM3 to, to be um, consistent and, and uh, future proof. But there is a lot of uh, legacy OM1 in uh, in systems. OM3 and OM4 are uh, optimized fibers uh, to uh, enable longer distances. And we've talked about OS, optical fiber uh, single mode. There are two main types here, uh, OS1 and 2. Uh, both incorporate a 9 micron core. Uh, but the OS1 tends to be used with 1310 nanometer wavelengths and OS2 uh, with 1550 nanometers. And OS2 is also used uh, more to describe optical fiber that's used in uh, the outdoors or uh, outside plant. So we've talked about um, uh, optical fibers. Uh, we want to uh, see some of the applications uh, in which fiber is used, uh, you know, outdoor or between buildings, long distances, EMI. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, we would say the single mode is, is uh, uh, more expensive when used with the transceivers than a multi-mode equivalent. So that will give the cost of that will give us guidance. So there's a choice that can be made uh, to use either single mode or, or multi-mode fiber. And so the performance aside, it's, it's really based on the, the cost uh, factor of this. This is an example here, uh, which uh, is, is showing a comparison between the uh, use of multi-mode and single-mode fiber. On the left-hand column, you can see some representative prices uh, of uh, fiber uh, per meter. For a certain length, uh, we can work out the fiber cost. And these are typical transceiver costs that you would see. And you can see the difference between the single mode and multi mode uh, transceiver costs. Given that uh, this particular example was using six of these transceivers, you can see that this single mode uh, configuration uh, is costing uh, more than twice that of the multi mode. That's in those cases when you can you would need to co consider the cost equations when you could use both fiber types. Obviously, um, you know, if you had a five kilometer run to, 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 um, to cover, uh, then that would have to be covered by single mode. Multi-mode fiber would not be used in that case. So in a way, the cost uh, is not so much the issue. Here's another example looking at some different uh, fiber types. This is armored fiber here, uh, which is certainly more than uh, more expensive than its uh, the previous uh, example. And again, shows here that um, 
uh, single mode uh, is still uh, more expensive, but obviously the difference now that the fiber is costing more uh, is lessened. This diagram here um, shows uh, fiber in the different ways that it is available. And I'll just talk about the left-hand part of this. You can see on the, the top horizontal run is, is showing an example where um, the uh, armored fiber uh, is used um, and is supported by uh, J-hooks, for example. Uh, very often, um, these runs are made sort of a, you know, across the ceiling, supported, you know, the pathway itself is a, a is comprised of uh, J-hooks spaced at regular intervals. The center diagram shows an example where a, um, a wire grid type pathway is used to uh, support the fiber. And there we can use either the armored fiber or we can use, um, for example, dielectric conducted fiber. That is optical fiber su surrounded by a very durable and hard wearing uh, and crush resistant uh, dielectric uh, outer uh, sleeve effectively. And that provides a good um, you know, protection against environments. And then finally, more conventional, a less protected cable that would actually be a, typically run in a covered uh, pathway. Looking at these um, in just in a little bit more detail here, one of the differences, of course, between the metallic armored cabling and the dielectric armored cabling that we're showing here is that the uh, metal armoring would require a consideration of grounding at both ends. So what would happen is uh, the armored cable would enter into, for example, a metallic enclosure, and attention would be needed to be paid to um, uh, properly bonding that uh, outer armoring to the ground potential point uh, of the uh, enclosure. And that has to take place at both ends. So that just gives uh, an example of what does a, um, a, a meta you know, metallic armored cable look like. Uh, very often, you know, uh, very much state of the art. Uh, these are available with a variety of fiber counts. Um, you, know, you can see through here all the way up to 144. These are often available in uh, all of the different uh, modes, uh, both multi-mode and single-mode fiber types we'd identified. This just shows some examples of uh, how that uh, optical fiber could be deployed uh, in a typical sort of shop floor environment. Uh, you can see uh, on the top left there, the optical fiber was, is actually leading into uh, a type of uh, zone enclosure um, on the bottom right hand side with uh, you know, cleats and clips attached to the walls. The dielectric armored cable we, we've talked about, it, uh, uh, it has also a benefit that it's uh, significantly lighter than the uh, metallic armored cable. Uh, it has a better bend radius and uh, we've already mentioned that it can be uh, deployed without uh, being installed into conduit or some kind of covered pathway. So it can be used with J-hooks uh, and uh, a relatively undefined pathway. Typical application for uh, the uh, fiber uh, that we've seen near the shop floor is, is the device level ring, for example, uh, that's used uh, again to promote uh, resilient uh, network, Ethernet networks. Also, I want to mention the other type of fiber we talked about. That's uh, PCF, uh, polymer clad fiber. Uh, the diameter of the, the cladding, of course, is significantly larger. Uh, it's now 200 microns and, uh, rather than the uh, you know, 50 that we saw uh, before. And what will happen uh, is that that really aids and helps uh, the installation of the optical fiber. Uh, typically, it's used at uh, lower data rates, 10, 100. 
and typically uh, we've seen it used for OM1 legacy installations and OM2. Uh, you can get these in so-called breakout cables, uh, two, two or four fiber. They're also supplied uh, in a, a duplex zip cord uh, that you can see on the bottom right hand side there. Connectors have been developed for a polymer clad fiber cable. Again, uh, focusing on the LC connector. Uh, and you know th this can be used for like a direct attach uh, field installed uh, build. Uh, the current uh, termination technologies, um, you can uh, uh, you know this is can be handled by um, uh, operators who have received uh, little training in this. Highly reliable to get a uh, fully secure and high performance uh, connection. And that just shows some of the easy steps with, with the tools. So it's basically install the connector into the crimp itself, uh, prepare the cable, insert that into the crimp, uh, you, the, the connector already loaded, crimp it, cleave it, that's, that's uh, cut the fiber, and then, then install the back shell. So what about cable? In the real world, you know, we've we've talked about the difference between the industrial and the enterprise environment, and so what happens here is that we need to be aware of uh, the environment, and we refer to a term used in the TIA 1005 as MICE. MICE stands for mechanical, ingress, climatic slash chemical and then electromagnetic. And, and basically, a level one is typically a, an office environment. As you move through level two to level three, that might be found in industrial. And this sort of talks about the environment. And that consideration of the environment gives you a reflection of, of what has to happen uh, for the performance requirements of your fiber. So some of the other fiber types that we see here are the uh, so-called indoor fiber that might be used in the enterprise or going from the enterprise to the micro data center. And then the use of armored clad fiber as you get more onto the shop floor and uh, dielectric armored fiber and polymer clad fiber. Having installed the optical fiber, uh, now comes the, the point of actually testing it. There are test sets to I allow you to test that uh, installed permanent link. It validates the performance against the standards and requirements outlined and given in TIA 568. It will allow you to identify connections with a high loss, for example, if the, the termination had been made poorly. And it finds ref connectors with uh, a high ref reflectance or ref you know, reflectivity levels. So leading towards the uh, conclusion here, a summary of some of the factors that influence the uh, fiber type. Obviously, the connectivity count, or how many fibers would you include in that armored or that uh, distribution cable? Obviously, that depends on the number of devices and the number of machines. The environment itself, what level of protection has to be provided by that fiber? Uh, are there other, is there anything else uh, in the vicinity, for example, copper cabling or power cabling? The bandwidth, which re re you know, depends on the current network utilization, but must emphasize also to look uh, into the future and future-proof that, uh, that fiber. The cable reach, obviously, anything over 100 meters is, is going to uh, certainly give the most serious consideration to fiber. And then finally, safety, security, and longevity. So summing this up, we can kind of, you know, as we step through this presentation, we can look at the, the best practices that have really sort of been outlined here. You know, the starting point, I always think, is the, the adoption and the use of the converged plant-wide Ethernet topology. Focus the designs on standards. I talked about the TIA, of course, but in uh, other parts of the world, um, a IEC and ISO standards, for example, 11801, uh, 
is very uh, aligned to TIA 568. We talked about the zone topology as a way of consolidating a high data rate uh, cabling uh, up defined pathways or along defined pathways. We identified the targets for optical fiber. And then finally, I uh, understood how to select the right fiber. Know the equipment and the network you're connecting to. Understand the distance requirements and the fiber count. And then finally, make consideration of where or what type of environment this fiber is going to be uh, in, installed into. And then finally, measure the permanent link performance. So just a, a, a couple of slides here that will give um, some additional references. A design guide for fiber and industrial applications uh, that you can see here, and then a, a copy of the converged plant-wide Ethernet uh, design and implementation guide. Some of the other res resources, uh, talking about uh, the integrated network zone system that sort of promotes and outlines uh, zone topology, uh, information on the uh, Stratix uh, Rockwell automation type switching, talk about zone architecture video, and then various design tools uh, that can be found in software. So with that, I'm now going to hand it back to Mark and would like to thank you once again for your uh, attention today. Thanks very much, Bob. That was a terrific presentation. Now we'll get to a few audience questions. Uh, the audience listening live can type uh, questions for today's presenter in the Ask a Question box on the screen. Uh, we will get to as many questions as we can, and when, then within a few days the presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website and then send out an email message with a link connecting directly to it and to related resources after it's ready. Now on to the questions. Uh, I will move back to the resource slide uh, during the Q&A, uh, but do please continue to uh, submit your questions. Uh, first question, Bob, uh, what cabling issues are you seeing at the uh, 100 megabit per second Ethernet over fiber copper? Uh, that, that's a, 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 a great question, and uh, it, it, it's, it's good in, in a one way because it, it recognizes one of the things that we're seeing um, in the industrial uh, application is uh, increasing data rates. Um, industrial uh, networks, uh, down at the control panel and at the machine, uh, data rates tended to have been uh, slower uh, at 10 megabits per second, uh, but we've seen uh, that these have increased up to uh, making many uses of uh, 100 megabits per second. Uh, some of the things that happened on uh, uh, optical fiber, uh, sorry, uh, copper cabling, for example, uh, would be the need to really understand uh, the shielding um, that is associated with, for example, shielded copper cabling. The idea of proper uh, bonding practices of the shield to the uh, enclosures at both ends, consideration uh, of the um, of ground loops that might occur um, if the if the utility feeds uh, different parts of that industrial uh, application. On the fiber side, uh, really what we've seen is a transition from uh, legacy OM1 through to OM2. But uh, these these fibers have very uh, reliable uh, performance in supporting uh, 100. Uh, megabits per second, and, and in fact, uh, they're very well future-proofed to support um, certainly OM2 th you know, th through to gigabit, and with the optimized fibers, OM3 and OM4, uh, are even suited uh, to um, support 10 gigabits uh, per second, should that ever be required. Of course, the transceiver would need to be changed associated with that uh, increase in data rate. Good, thank you. Can you go over the difference between OS1 and OS2 single mode fiber? You, you talked about a lot of different kinds. Maybe you could uh, review the differences there. All right, there are two main uh, differences. Um, OS2 uh, 
is is the specification for uh, OS2 uh, allows it to be uh, used in an outdoor environment. The issue with uh, using fiber outdoors is that um, it's subject to much more temperature variation in an outdoor environment than in, for example, a, a, a more benign uh, enterprise uh, type of application. And if you recall, one of the slides that talked about the construction of the uh, optical fiber, I mentioned that the buffer was a, a, a protective coating that was actually put around the cladding, the actual silica itself. And that, uh, you know, there can, can be sort of micro cracking that can occur due to um, uh, expand, differential expansion in um, those uh, larger temp varying temperature uh, kind of situations. So OS2 is, is uh, made of a different construction and actually incorporates a loose tube that is placed around the, uh, the silica that's there more for protection. So it allows that uh, differential movement. Good, thanks. Um, one of the benefits of twisted uh, pair copper cabling is that it can support power. Any comments about how fiber can support power as well? Yeah, that's a great, great, great question because it, you know, the idea of um, twisted uh, pair of copper cabling is, is of course, as, as, as folk will know, is it's uh, capable of supporting power over Ethernet, so-called PLE, and and those standards are changing and developing. Um, first standard allows you to, you know, support about 13 watts at the far end. Uh, that's been increased now through. Um, uh, standards-based work to uh, 25 watts, and even uh, you know, uh, higher powers are being looked at as well. What we've tended to find is um, there is a call for optical fiber to support power uh, in, in specialist applications like video surveillance. For example, you have a, a surveillance camera at the far end of a uh, large industrial campus, for example, and very often they are at that because there will be at corners and, and, and the areas uh, to provide that coverage. And what happens is, is, is it's longer than 100 meters, so POE in that sense can't be used. What we have seen is we've actually seen a hybrid cable being used where uh, optical fiber would support the data and there'd be a larger gauge conductors that are also run in, a, um, in, a, in the same jacket uh, as that optical fiber to supply the power. In actual fact, more in the industrial uh, environment, we haven't really seen this to be uh, too much uh, of an issue. And the reason is, is because you know the switch will take more power than is just available by um, uh, PLE uh, on its own. And certainly, if you have additional equipment in that uh, enclosure. So that uh, it's usually utility fed at that point, uh, at the point of an enclosure uh, anyway. So uh, it tends to be just a, a, a data, a, an optical fiber data cable that is run between those enclosures in, in one of those uh, figures that I showed, the uh, resilient Ethernet protocol. Sure. Um, what influences the number of cores for fiber optic cable? It really depends on how uh, the, the, the idea of, of the, the number of cores, uh, it, it's going to um, be influenced by the number of devices uh, you connect to, but also um, the way that you connect those uh, devices. Um, we've talked about you know, resilient uh, Ethernet protocol. Um, really, um, since we're attaching one switch to the next uh, in a ring-like fashion, uh, in actual fact, you literally would only need the uh, two cores uh, for each one of the SFP modules that we used in the switch. Um, whereas, if you used, for example, a, type, a bus type of topology, uh, what, what happens is you would use, say, like a distribution cable with a number of um, a fibers uh, within the uh, jacket, 
and literally you, you, you would drop off however many you need for each device. It might be four fibers, one for, you know, two for the uh, main uh, SFP uh, module, and then another two for the redundant SFP module. So that you would drop four off that distribution cable, and the rest of the uh, cable would go on to the next um, a device, you know, sort of further uh, down in the network. Very good. Well, what type of fiber solution is recommended for 100 uh, gigabit per second speeds? Would that be o OM4 or higher? And then for longer distances, would it be OS1 or OS2 or something beyond that? You you mentioned that you I think you said did you say 100 gigabit or 100 megabit? Uh, 100 gigabit speeds. Well, certainly you need um, a, you know, a, a OM4 for the, those type of uh, data rates, but we're certainly not seeing those kind of data rates in um, an industrial in environment. What what we're seeing at the moment uh, is uh, certainly on the uplinks for the switches that are located on the shop floor, we're seeing single gigabit uh, solutions. Uh, the up, uplinks from the switch, whereas the downlinks uh, we're seeing uh, at, at 10, 100. So um, I don't think I've heard of any application so far that would require uh, 100 gigabit. Where 100 gigabit would be required is in some extremely uh, high performance uh, you know, um, data center application, and I know the standards organizations, the IEEE, for example, uh, is looking at those type of standards, and there certainly have, have been uh, transmissions that have taken place at those high data rates, but don't see anything for that kind of use uh, at the moment in, the, uh, in a typical industrial application. Good. Uh, is there a validation tool for fiber? Well, yes. We, um, mentioned that uh, in in the presentation uh, the the need to measure the uh, performance of the permanent link uh, that is uh, what, what would typically happen there is optical fiber would let's say connect two of the uh, two switches uh, that are located in zone enclosures what would happen is uh, the fiber is actually terminated uh, and then a um, it's connected to an adapter that also takes a uh, patch cord to attach the um, to attach to the SFP module. At that fiber connector that's that's field installed, um, that whole permanent link, as it's called, uh, can be tested using uh, basically a, a, an OTDR, which is an optical time domain reflectometer, which measures uh, you know how much power is um, reflected from various points of mismatch along that uh, that optical fiber, and what happens is 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 you know that can be validated by a certified uh, installer, and, and typically the results are, are retained and kept um, you know as part of the uh, manufacturing IT group. Great, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, and thanks to the audience for the great questions. For the ones that we didn't get to, uh, Bob has offered to answer those offline, and we'll post those with the related resources with the, uh, the webcast. Uh, so I thank Bob Elliott, Business Development Manager, Industrial Automation Infrastructure Group for Panduit, for sharing his expertise today in the presentation and the, the Q&A session. I'd also like to extend special thanks to our sponsor, Panduit, for uh, sponsoring today's event. And now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen just as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use the information to improve future webcasts. On behalf of CFE Media and Control Engineering, thanks for attending the webcast, Copyright 2015 CFE Media. This concludes our webcast today. Thank you very much. <laughs>